I played 11 new cozy games that came out this month. And in this video, I'm reviewing all of them. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Peyton. It is nice to meet you, it is nice to see you, and welcome to the corner. April was another month jam-packed with cozy game releases. And as much as I love to just like tell you about all of the new games coming up, I also like to actually play the games that I tell you about myself and then tell you what I ended up thinking about the games. In this video, I'm going to be giving you a first impressions review of every single cozy game I played this month. I like to call this a first impressions review because unfortunately, I didn't have the time to completely finish every single game ever, but I did play each of these games for more than a few hours, enough to the point where I felt like I really understood how I was feeling about the game, even being so early on. In today's video, I'll tell you my overall thoughts of every game I played, in addition to the pros and the cons of each game, so you yourself can decide if you think the game in particular is worth it for you. And if all of that sounds interesting, I actually made this exact video last month with March cozy game releases, so if you wanna check that out, you could, you know, click around, it'll be there. This month, I was able to cover even more games than I did last month. Specifically, I was able to cover 11 games. And I would not have been able to cover 11 games in this video if so many of the lovely, lovely game developers and publishing companies had not given me the opportunity to play their game for free. So some of the games in this video were gifted to me, but just because they were gifted to me, it doesn't change my opinion on how I think about the game. But just for full transparency, before I tell you about each game, I'll tell you which ones exactly I was gifted. But before we get into it, please be sure to click the lovely little like button as well as subscribe for more cozy, chaotic content. Okay, I'll shut up because we have a lot of games to review. The first game we're gonna talk about is actually two games in one, and that is Coffee Talk. The second and newest episode in the Coffee Talk series, Coffee Talk 2, Hibiscus and Butterfly, is the new game of the month that came out in April, and the original Coffee Talk came out in 2020. But I had never played the original game, so I went ahead and played that one before checking out the second game. The second game in this series was very kindly gifted to me, so thank you so much to Toge Productions for sending the game my way to give me the chance to check it out. Coffee Talk is a coffee brewing and heart-to-heart -heart talking simulator about listening to fantastical characters' problems. As the barista at a late night coffee shop, it's up to you to get to know the characters by serving them the correct drinks, making choices, and maybe even making some latte art. Episode one takes place in 2020, and being the first game, you get introduced to a wide range of colorful characters, from vampires to werewolves to elves and a whole lot more, all of which have various struggles. Over the course of the game, you'll get to form relationships and make discoveries about the complicated world you live in. Episode two, however, takes place in 2023. You'll get to check back in with all of the original characters from the first game and even get introduced to some new characters and also most notably new drink ingredients that will make a huge amount of stunning drinks. Episode two will also introduce some new mechanics not seen in the first game, like being able to hold and give items for the guests, which increases the amount of ways the story can go. At its core, both Coffee Talk games are interactive visual novels with stunning art and the chillest lo-fi beats imaginable. Now let's get into my pros for the game. My favorite part of the game is the fact that your choices matter. Specifically, your drinks matter. You can play each game multiple times and unlock new information and new storylines just based off of what drinks you serve each character. In episode two, you also have the newly added feature of deciding when to give characters items, which gives you even more options in the first game to really drive the story further. Another new feature in the second game is the ability to use your smartphone to see characters' social media stories and also the ability to track your friendship progression, which I found really useful to kind of see where I was at with each character and, you know, how I was doing in the game. Another huge pro of this game is the characters and their stories themselves, which you know, is kind of the most important part. While fantastical and beautiful, these characters are incredibly deep and deal with serious issues, many of which surround the issue of prejudice based off of the type of creature they are and what the world thinks of them, but also what they think of themselves. 
And truthfully, there wasn't a single storyline that I was not interested in. Whenever a character came in the door, I was always really excited to see what they had to say and continue on in their personal story. Something else I love about the game is the actual coffee making mechanic. While you don't have a super crazy amount of ingredients, there are a large amount of drinks to discover, ranging from basic to very, very intricate. Moving on to my cons for the game. I'm gonna be honest. I don't really have any. I liked it that much. I guess I could say that people might find it negative that you do pretty much need to play episode one to enjoy episode two. You can't really just jump into episode two. I'm sure hypothetically you could, but I don't think you would appreciate the characters and have a really good grasp on what the heck is going on. I really actually like this. It makes you feel more invested in the story having going from part one to part two, but I can understand some people might just wanna check out the newest game rather than starting from the beginning. And also the only other major con I could think of for this game is the fact that it is a visual novel. So it is a lot of reading. So if you do not wanna read, this one is not going to be for you. Overall, both Coffee Talk 1 and Coffee Talk 2 have been my favorite games of the year so far. Shh, don't tell. I ended up playing both games storylines through to completion because frankly, I couldn't put it down. This game is available on both PC and on Nintendo Switch, but I played both games exclusively on my Steam Deck and both games ran amazingly on there. The next game we're going to talk about is Fabledom. And this game was also very kindly gifted to me. So thank you so, so much to the people at Greena Games for sending this over my way so I could check it out for the video. Fabledom is the ideal laid back city builder. You get to enjoy the growth of your settlement, trade, and use diplomacy to ally or challenge your neighbors, and most importantly, find yourself a prince or a princess and live happily ever after. It's part management game, part customization game, and part strategy game, as you need to combine all three to make the very perfect settlement. Now getting into the pros of the game. I really love how the game looks and how it feels. It gives the perfect vibe of an old time storybook village that's surrounded by beautiful nature and there's even adorable flying pigs to discover. The map is easy to manipulate and I feel like they give you a lot of options to play as comfortably as you please. I also really like that you can manipulate time to make the game go faster or slower, which will allow you to either totally speed run through your constructions like I do, or to take your time and let things go as they please. The game also features a stunning visual change as the seasons change, which is always really exciting to see, especially when winter comes around. I also really love the idea of visiting neighboring villages that you can trade with or even declare war with. But I think my favorite part of the game so far are the adorable buildings you can place and the different decorations you can utilize. There's already a decent amount of buildings, ranging from farms to theaters to inns, and I foresee them adding even more at the game's full release because this is actually just its early access version. Now getting into the cons, but like I just said, keeping in mind this game is actually just in early access, so this is not the full view of the game that we're getting, just an early version of it. But overall, honestly, I feel like it is a very strong early access game. My biggest con so far in the game is that I want a little bit more from the actual fablings. I know, I know this is mainly a building game, but I would love to see a bit more interaction between the fablings, reactions from them, and more diversity in them as they all look exactly the same. Being that this is a fairy tale world, I'd love to see them include a bit more fantastical elements in the characters if possible. The flying pigs were awesome, for example, but just like more of that. I also think they do a really good job of explaining things in the game, but some aspects could be outlined a little bit better. For example, I could not for the life of me figure out why my fablings stopped gathering wood until I realized I needed to build an additional building so they would replant the trees they chopped down and then they'd go get more wood. Also, sometimes I find I do have the necessary resources I need to build something, but my fablings just don't do it. Not sure if that's my own user error, but it did definitely take me out of the game a little bit and left me confused. 
Overall, I've actually really enjoyed playing Fabledom. It's definitely a more simple laid back builder, but I think it has a lot of character to it. Right now, Fabledom is only available on PC as it's in early access, but I have a feeling there's a lot more in store for this one. The next game we're gonna talk about is Melon Journey Bittersweet Memories. Melon Journey Bittersweet Memories is a story exploration game about getting caught up in the outlandish happenings of a small world where melons are illegal. It follows you as an employee of a melon soda factory who's on a mission to find her recently missing best friend. Along the way, you meet insanely eccentric characters and you get to make your way through an adorable town. The game also features an all green pixel art style that'll bring you right back to the nostalgic feeling of early gaming. Now let's get into the pros. My number one pro for Melon Journey is that it is the weirdest little game I've ever played and I'm loving it. Specifically, it's the characters and the game dialogue that are kind of hilariously weird. The debate of legalizing melons is funny enough, but every character is just kind of weird in their own way. There's a puppy and a hamster pop star. There's a gang of cute animals, ghosts, and even a mare with an affinity for yo-yos. Each time I saw a new character emerge, I knew I was in for something unique, whether they had a lot to say or a little bit to say. I also really love the art and the music in this game. It absolutely captures the nostalgic gaming feel, but it also makes it feel a little bit cozier. My last pro could also kind of be a con, depending on the type of gamer you are and how you look at it. That's why I try to give you the pros and cons rather than the, yes, this is good, no, this is not good type thing because I think there are different gamers who are looking for different things. But I would say my pro that could also be a con is that the game is pretty easy. It's not really a puzzle game. It's an exploration game where you pretty much just need to find the right location and then things happen around you. This is definitely good for a more laid back, cozy gaming approach, which I definitely appreciate it, but might not be great if you're looking for something a little bit more complicated. Speaking of the cons, let's get into them. My main con for the game is that it's quite short. The full story will only take you about five to six hours to complete. And while it's a super great time throughout those five to six hours, it's really easy to just breeze through it. And like I just said, it's not overly complicated. You're pretty much just going room to room while things happen around you. I don't always mind a game being short, but I do sometimes think you need to look at the price of the game and look at how much content there is for the price of the game. And also for me, can I replay this game? And I think for Mel and Journey, once you get through the end of the story, you're through the end of the story and there's not really anything else for you to do. But overall, I really enjoyed my time playing Mel and Journey. It was quirky, it was fun, and it made me laugh a lot. This game is available for both Nintendo Switch and for PC, and this one I played exclusively on Nintendo Switch. The next cozy game on the list is called Wild Frost. And Wild Frost was very kindly gifted to me, so thank you so much to the people at Chucklefish Games for sending me a key so I was able to check out the game. Wild Frost is a tactical, roguelike deck builder with what I personally deem to be very cozy graphics. In the game, you get to journey across a frozen tundra, collecting cards strong enough to banish the eternal winter. How the game works is that for each run you do, you'll get to pick a leader from a variety of tribes that are totally randomized with different skills and abilities. Then you'll get to choose companion cards to back you up and hopefully help you win the battle. You'll collect additional cards, charms, and companions along the way as you try to make it to the final boss. And if you don't, well, you could just start over again and again and again and again and again. Getting into the pros, my favorite, favorite thing about Wild Frost is the variety of cards the game has to offer. Not only do they look super cute, but the game is very intricate and there are a lot of special abilities that can be utilized to help you tremendously in battle and also some abilities that totally stink and you wanna just like get out of there and avoid. Although it could totally ruin your run, I also really love the idea that you start with a randomized leader. It makes every run feel different and it gives you the opportunity to test out which type of characters and skills you work best with. I also really love that there's no time limit on your moves. This is actually my first deck builder game, so forgive me if this is like standard for all the deck builder games. I really like that you can take your time to think about each move because frankly, you kind of need to. I also really enjoy that when you lose your runs, you still make progress in the game. Specifically, you still unlock achievements even when you lose so that you can access more cards and characters for your next run. 
You also unlock new buildings in the town to visit to help you on your runs as well. Something else I like about Wild Frost is I think it explains deck building pretty simply in case you've never played a deck builder before. I found the tutorial very helpful and I feel like they also give you tips and tricks along the way if you're struggling for the most part. Moving on to my cons for the game. The main con is that the game is difficult. This is not an easy game. Do not let the cozy graphics confuse you. This is not an easy time. And I think this is hard even if you're used to deck building games. And my issue isn't with the game being hard itself. I think it's great that it's challenging, but I think sometimes it just feels like the opponents are way stronger than you. Plus, it feels like they always seem to outnumber you. And if you make one error, you lose the whole game or you lose the whole run rather, which I did lose many runs for five hours straight. I also think some of the cards were a little bit confusing to me. I think they started off really strong with outlining tips and the tutorial, but then as you get a little bit further on when you get more cards, I found some of them to be a little bit confusing, but I do recognize that could also just be me because I'm not used to this type of game. And this could kind of be some standard stuff in deck building games like this that I just wasn't aware of. Despite me literally never winning, I came close a few times, okay? I really loved my time playing Wild Frost and I feel like it has developed my brain skills like no other game has. Even though I lost a lot, I found it really exciting to keep going and try to improve to get better. I'm not exactly sure if everyone would classify this as a cozy game, but I think if you take your time to really plan out your moves and not just frantically click buttons like I do, it can be a really chill and laid back experience. And this game is available on Nintendo Switch and PC, but I played it exclusively on my Steam Deck and it ran great. The next game we're gonna talk about is called Paparazzi. Paparazzi is a game that sees you on a mission to take photos. Photos of many, many puppies. The game features a quirky art style with various locations and many dogs doing many interesting activities. Throughout the game, you're tasked with different photos to capture, whether that be to find a dog at the beach or to find a dog at the skate park or to take a photo of a dog with a fashionable outfit. It's your job to complete all of the tasks and mainly have fun with all of the dogs. Now let's get into my pros for the game. My biggest pro for paparazzi is that it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's constantly entertaining to see the dogs in different ways, doing strange activities, and taking photos of them is super adorable. The game also gives you some different camera features to let you get more and more creative as you progress through the game. Notably, you'll have a black and white lens, you can shoot portrait style, or even take advantage of a fisheye lens. I think though the biggest pro for the game is it is super laid back and you can kind of do a little bit of whatever you want. Now getting on to my cons for the game. Found that overall there were a lot of things that just didn't work. There were a lot of times I would take a photo of something I was tasked with, but it wasn't counted toward the actual task. And there were other times random photos that weren't even what I was asked to photograph would count toward the task. It was a little bit frustrating as they don't give you feedback on the photos to tell you why it counts toward completing the goal or why it doesn't. Something else I did not enjoy was that there was a limit on how many photos you can take. The whole game is all about taking pictures, so I'm not sure why they put a limit on the amount of pictures you could take. Strangely, you can get around this just by exiting the location you're in and then coming back. And once you do that, your film will reset without you needing to buy any more, which is fine. I think I just wish the game would decide either let's put restrictions on the photos we're taking and make it more challenging or no restrictions whatsoever and really lean into the laid back approach it seems to give off. Despite everything else I just said, I think the main con I have for the game is it is $20 and I don't think there's that much to do. Sure, it is super cute to run around taking pictures of dogs. I just wanted there to be a little bit more content for the price. Overall, I think Paparazzi is super cute. It was a quirky and a fun time, but it didn't really give me the feeling that I needed to go back to it. Paparazzi is available both on Nintendo Switch and for PC, and this one I played exclusively on Nintendo Switch. The next game on the list is called Minibo, A Walk Through Life. And by the time this video is out, the game actually comes out today. You can get the game now. And I was very kindly able to check out this game early. So thank you so much to Devilish Games for sending me a key. I appreciate it so, so much. Minibo, A Walk Through Life is a social simulation game where you walk the path of life while your turnip grows and thrives, or not, in social relationships. Life starts when you sprout, and time goes by with every step you take. 
and you can set your pace at any moment. You live and you learn. You surround yourself with other turnips and interact with them to forge your personality. Your acquired strengths and weaknesses will affect your future interactions. Mainly, it's your job to keep yourself alive. And you do this by balancing your amount of physical touch, intimacy, and your sense of belonging. And you also make sure the people around you, well, the ones you care to live around you, have those things as well. In the game, you can play along to different missions, which basically give you a list of goals for each run of life you take. Some goals can include living to a certain age, having a certain amount of romance partners, or even the number of pets you acquire in the life. Each mission gets harder and harder and way more intricate as you go. And once you get through five missions, you can also unlock free play to just live your turnips life. However the heck you want. The game features a colorful and fun art and music style, which brings light and humor to the fact that the game does tackle the very serious subject of life, death, and the choices we make while we're alive. Now let's start out with the pros. My favorite part of Minabo A Walk Through Life was like all of it, like most of the game was my favorite part. I really loved this game. I knew I was gonna love this game. Just from the trailer, I knew, I said in my video, I was like, this looks like it's for me. I was right, it was for me. I love the game's joyous music and the adorable turnip art style. It has a lot of humor to it, which makes it a lot easier to deal with your turnip just like, randomly dying of loneliness out of nowhere. What I love specifically about the art is that as the turnips grow, they dramatically change. You can literally see yourself go from baby turnip to elderly turnip in just a few minutes. Also, the pets you can acquire are absolutely precious and they must be protected at all costs. The game also features different hats your turnip can win along their walk and each hat not only makes you look super cute, but it gives you different abilities and changes the outcome of your run at life. All of this being said, one of the best parts about the game is chaos can and will ensue in this game. You can blatantly just ignore people if you like, or have a million best friends, have a million lovers, and children too. And then as you get further into the missions, there's also like this giant bear that you have to run away from as an attempt to get you to live your life not too slowly. And each go at life that you do will give you a recap at the end to show you the memories you made along the way and also tell you how you did. Now let's get into the cons for the game. Like I said, I don't really have any. I guess my only real con that I could think of is sometimes the pacing is tricky, but I think that's the whole point of the game. Some runs can feel really slow and other runs of the game just breeze by. Also, the other characters will move at varying paces, so it can be hard to keep everyone you want around. But again, I feel like that is a totally intentional choice by the game and that you kind of have to prioritize who you want to stick around with. If someone's too slow and there's a bear chasing you, you might just got to leave them and there might not be other people ahead for you to meet. That's really the only negative thing I could think of. This is definitely one of the most fun games I've ever played. It is weird, unique, and I'm so into it. Overall, Minabo A Walk Through Life is, is a lighthearted journey with fun and with chaos, but also it's kind of incredibly deep at the same time. And Minabo A Walk Through Life is now available for a Nintendo Switch and for PC, and this one I played exclusively on my Steam Deck and it ran great. The next game on the list is called Trey Racers. And Trey Racers is actually a free game that you can play, but they do have an additional supporters pack, which will give you some bonus perks. And I was very kindly gifted that supporters pack. So thank you so much to Bitloom for sending me over the game and giving me access to the supporters pack. Trey Racers is a free to play racing game set in a vibrant post-apocalyptic world. Armed with nothing but your trusty Trey, you play as a ragtag kid speedster, where you can race solo or with up to 16 players through a wacky playground of randomly generated sand dunes, cute critters, bouncy cactus forests, and more. And the game also includes cross-platform play, so you can play with your friends if you're on Switch and they're on PC or vice versa. Now let's get into the pros of the game. My favorite part of Trey Racers is that they have this wonderful mechanic of giving you practice rounds before the actual ranked race. This is great because it gives you and all of the other players a chance to get familiar with the twisting and turning tracks before it actually counts for anything. 
And if you're like me and you can't help but steer your tray into the plentiful amount of cacti, this definitely comes in handy. I also love the game's art style and the world it creates. Each level stays completely true to the desert theme and the color palette, but features different obstacles and benefits. However, my favorite part is the area you chill at when you are waiting for other players to join. I also really enjoyed the different customizations available. However, all of that being said, I think the best part of the game is that it's free. For a free game, I feel like there is a lot of content and a lot of fun to be had. But that being said, let me tell you about some of my cons for the game. The cons I have for the game are really not that extensive, seeing as the game is free, and I feel like there's already a lot in it for what it is. I think one con I do have of the game though, is that the practice mechanic is a little bit confusing. Like I said, I love that it exists, but I didn't really understand what it was until well into playing. I think it just needs to be explained a little clearer that you get a certain amount of practice time before the round, and then you yourself need to spawn your character to keep on practicing. And I would also love if there was an option to choose your own courses. Overall, I think Tray Racers is a super fun game. I love that it's free because it feels really easy to get your friends in on it, or for me, I was able to get my streaming community in on it. And because it is free, and if you have access to the Nintendo Switch, or to PC, you'll be able to play this one. The next game on the list is called Song of the Prairie, and this is another early access game. Song of the Prairie is a 3D relaxing farming sim game. You play as a hero who has just defeat a demon in their past, and now you're beginning a new rural life. In that life, you get to experience the fun of exploration across a large town. You'll get to harvest giant crops and fruits, take care of fantastical animals, and even date somebody that you like. Song of the Prairie pretty much takes all of the basic farming sim stuff, but then just makes it larger, aesthetically pleasing, and magical. I do find it difficult to give first impressions of farming sim games specifically, because I feel like you have to get really far in the farming sim to kind of see all of the stuff, but I'll do my best to give you my pros and cons in my first few hours of gameplay. My biggest pro for Song of the Prairie is definitely the giant crops and animals. It feels like something that makes this farm sim stand out from others. I definitely do not need to wonder if I watered my crops for this one because it is very obvious. I also think the animals are super adorable looking and overall the vibe of the game is super cozy and chill. The music itself I really found relaxing and pleasing as I played. Another pro that I have is that the map feels quite big. I frequently get lost, but luckily there is fast travel on the back of a pig to help out. I also think the decorations and customizations are really cute, and I'm excited to unlock even more as I get further in the game. I also enjoy the fact that you can plant a lot of crops at once, making the farming process itself a little bit more seamless. And one of the other greatest parts of the game is the strange lack of loading screens. There are no cuts when you go in and out of buildings, and even when your character goes to bed to start a new day. Because of this, it feels really easy to just keep on playing. And also, you can save whenever and wherever. Speaking of that, there feels like there's a lot to do. On top of all the classic farming sim stuff, the NPCs always have tasks for you to do, with rewards once you complete the tasks. Now on to the cons. And keeping in mind, this is just the early access version, so it's not going to reflect the full game's release. But I do have quite a few cons for this one. One of the major cons I have for this game is that the customization is limited. The options that exist are absolutely adorable, but there is not an opportunity to change the character's body shape, which I think is a shame because they provide a lot of other options in different areas. Other than that, the main issue I have with the customization though is the game is gender locked. In the beginning of the game, you get to choose between two characters, either a gardener or a fishing person. But these options are locked to male and female, meaning the fishing person only gets to be male and the gardener only gets to be female. Meaning if I wanted my character to reflect my gender, I couldn't get to be the fish person, which is upsetting because I always like to be the fish person. Gender lock is also a huge issue when you get to the clothing store in town. The outfits are not able to be purchased by you if you're not the correct gender, meaning your options are very limited. And sometimes there is a super cute outfit you might wanna buy, but you can't. And to me, this is really disappointing and one of the major drawbacks I have to the game. A game all about expression and whimsy should allow you to actually express yourself fully, I think. Other than that, the translation of the game is not great. 
Being that it's early access, this isn't the biggest deal in the world. The English translation is pretty rough, hard to understand, and at times just plain strange. Mainly this lends itself to the NPCs, which overall are really weird, very forward, and often make no sense. In addition to this, the controls themselves felt really clunky and confusing to me. I ended up having way more luck when I started playing this on my Steam Deck rather than a keyboard and mouse because I found the controls just a little weird. And my last con, which is a pretty common con for a lot of farming sims, is I feel like they didn't explain things enough. I feel like a lot of times with farming sims, you kind of need to guess what you're doing and they don't really tell you how to do much of everything. Overall, I think Song of the Prairie is a cute farming sim with a lot of potential. The oversized crops make it feel super fun and whimsical, but it definitely needs a lot of work on customization, inclusivity, and work on the tutorial. Right now, the game is only available for early access on PC, but may come to Nintendo Switch and console later on. The next game on the list is another farming sim game, but this one is very different. And this game is called Roots of Pacha. Roots of Pacha is a co-op farming and life sim game set in the Stone Age, where you and your clan just settled in on promised and fertile land. By connecting with nature at your own pace, you'll help your clan evolve, develop culture and relationships, and discover the mysteries of Pacha, Mother Nature. The game puts you on a journey as you develop the tools and ideas that reshape the primitive world. You'll begin metalworking, create beautiful pottery and art, unlock your clan's spirituality, invent new buildings to expand your village any way you want, all while customizing your character and the space around you, and getting to know the other members of your clan, even playing along with your friends in co-op mode if you'd like. Now let's get into the pros of Roots of Pacha. My biggest pro for Roots of Pacha is the premise that the game follows. I'm always looking for farming sim games that feel like they innovate the farming sim genre. And Roots of Pacha does exactly that. Every part of the regular farming sim stuff feels completely fresh in this one because it's all about discovering these things for the very first time. Instead of buying seeds at a shop, you'll need to discover them on your own. Instead of having a bunch of fancy tools, you start off with just one that could pretty much do everything. Instead of buying animals for your farm, you get to connect and befriend wild animals by playing the music and trying to gain their trust. The fishing in this one is also very different from other fishing I've seen in farming games. It requires a lot of concentration and patience, which I really appreciate, but also it looks super cute and it's easy to kind of go after multiple fish at a time. The mines are also really interesting in this one because unlike many farming sims where you hit rocks until you find an entrance down, in this one, you can unlock multiple ways to get through the mine. I also really love that the game's currency is not actual money, but it's contributions to the clan. The game pays such a heavy focus on community and how every member in the clan is important. And so far, all of the characters feel really unique and interesting. And I also really like how large your farm space is and how there are multiple places to explore, whether you wanna stay close to home or venture off into the woods. Now going on to cons. I don't really have any so far. I really like this one. Again, farming some games, I think it's hard to get a good sense as you discover a lot of things as you go throughout. But so far, I don't really have that many cons. The only con I kind of have, which is kind of stupid because most farming sim games are like this, is that you can't save the game unless you complete the day. I find that in this game and games like this, where you don't have the opportunity to save midday, I'll start a day and get halfway through and then I have to stop playing, I have to go and do something and I can't save the game there, but I don't want to just lose the rest of the day by going to bed or closing the game and losing everything I did. So I just wish being able to save midday could be a nice option. Other than that, I don't really have anything else to say. I still have a lot to explore with this one, but definitely this is one of the best farming sim games I've played in a long time. Right now, Roots of Pacha is only available on PC, but I do know it will have a Nintendo Switch release at some point. And for this playthrough, I've been exclusively playing on the Steam Deck. And not only does the game run great on the Steam Deck, but it's actually deck verified. So you know, it's super great off the bat right on the Steam Deck, and I've really enjoyed that. The next game on the list is called Refresh. And I was very kindly gifted this one. So thank you so much to the people at Merge Conflict for sending me the game so I could check it out. Refresh is a 3D exploration platformer collectathon game where you collect materials to help you repair your town after a torrential storm. You play as an adorable little robot who cannot remember who he is 
and the town he lives in. But he does know he wants to help build everything back back to get it to be the way it once was. In the game, you get to explore your own pace in the open-ended environment and collect solar cells to upgrade your movement options. Solar cells are pretty much the main source of energy in the game for jumping and for dashing, and it's important to try to find all of them to be able to proceed in the game. My biggest pro for Refresh is just how overwhelmingly peaceful it is. With adorable graphics and cozy music, it feels like you're in for such a chill experience when you turn on the game. Something I love in particular is that there are adorable customizations for your robot after you help certain members of the town. I also really like the mechanic of the solar cells that you need to discover. There are certain areas you can only reach after you've acquired a certain amount of solar cells, so it makes it a little bit more challenging to make sure you find them all. As for the cons, my biggest con for the game is that it is quite short. The gameplay experience is about an hour and a half to slightly longer if you get stuck or you're just in totally no rush. And again, like I said before, I'm not always saying short games are bad. I like short games. In this one, I do think it is more justified because this game is only $4.99, so I do think that is a very fair price for the amount of content you're getting. However, I enjoyed the game so much for what it was, I wanted there to just be more. I would, not only do I wish it was longer, but I would love to see you be able to interact more with the characters and also be able to go inside the buildings that you helped to fix up. Overall, Refresh is a short but incredibly sweet game that I think is worth checking out. And it's available right now on PC, and I played the whole game on my Steam Deck, which ran amazing. And the final game on the list is called Mail Time. Mail Time is a relaxing cottagecore adventure set in a peaceful forest far, far away. It's your first day on the job as a newly minted mail scout, equipped with a mushroom hat, a pack full of letters, and an unbridled enthusiasm, it's time to deliver letters and packages across the Grumblewood Grove. Along your journey, you'll get to meet an adorable cast of woodland creatures, all who need your help, either delivering packages or finding them lost items. You'll even get to customize your Mail Scout to your liking. It's your job to explore, collect Mail Scout badges, deliver mail, and mostly just have a relaxing time with this adventure that you could take at your own pace. Now getting into the pros for the game. My number one pro for the game is definitely the game's aesthetic. It lives up to its promise of being a cozy cottagecore game. I really love how everything looks and there are such cute little details that are amazing. The characters themselves are also really cute looking and they all have really funny and witty dialogue across the board. And the dialogue feels very current and modern even though it takes place in a fictional woodland world. I found myself laughing a lot as I went through my play through and your character yourself has a lot of attitude to them which I really like and appreciate. I also really like that it's hard to get places in the game. It's not totally easy. In fact I played mail time on my live stream and I had many moments where I was screaming that I could not get up onto the mushrooms and to other things correctly, which I think is good because I think it does make the game more complicated and therefore gives you a little bit more time playing the game. The music in the game is also really adorable and I love how many side quests there are. It feels like you're going all over the place, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. And the game does not give you a map, which is definitely intentional because they want you to get confused and find your way through the forest to see if you can deliver everything to everybody. Now moving on to my cons for the game. I really just have one con for the game, I think. And that is, once again, the game is quite short. However, this game is not necessarily like, it's short, but I think there is an issue with the game where you can accidentally finish the game too soon, which is what happened to me. The whole premise of the game follows you trying to deliver a letter to a mysterious character named Greg. But along the way, you also get other tasks from other characters who will ask you to find other things. And I, accidentally found Greg before I finished most of my other tasks. So I was able to breeze through the game quite quickly. And if you're even smarter than me and you find out where Greg is right away, you accidentally end the game for yourself. I wanted there so badly to be a way to kind of back out of it and still go back and do everything, but it doesn't seem like there is that option unless I just start the game totally all over again. I don't necessarily mind the length of the game. I played it for 
three hours and I still had some more stuff to do. So I think you could probably get like three and a half to four hours, but I do think it is kind of an issue that you can potentially end the game super early. It would be really nice if they had Greg locked. So you had to do everything else before you got to find Greg. However, it does give the opportunity to have the player replay again and try and get all of the achievements. So I definitely will be replaying it myself and I can understand why they did that. Overall, I really loved Mail Time. This has been one of my most anticipated cozy games of the year and I really enjoyed my experience playing it. It did not let me down. I loved all the characters and I'm excited to go back through and play it some more. And there you guys have it. That was my review of 11 cozy games that I played this month, the month of April. Oh my goodness, but I wanna know your thoughts. Let me know down below in the comments which of these games looks the most exciting to you. And if you've played any of these games, which ones were your favorite? Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please be sure to click the lovely little like button as well as subscribe for more cozy, chaotic content. Thank you so much. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.